So welcome everyone. I'm going to get started. My name is Katie Burles and I'm one of the coordinators of the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. The Watershed Network acts as a regional umbrella network for organizations working on watershed stewardship to share experiences and resources and build knowledge and ex expertise in the Canadian Columbia Basin. Today is our first webinar in our winter webinar series and today's session will be delivered by Will Warnock with the Canadian Columbia Intertribal Fisheries Commission and he's going to discuss the history of salmon in the Columbia Basin and challenges for restoring salmon to the headwaters. So this webinar series is hosted in partnership with the Kootenai Conservation Program. The Kootenai Conservation Program is a broad partnership of organizations from across the Kootenays that works to conserve landscapes that sustain naturally functioning ecosystems. So we're really excited about this partnership as it's an opportunity for both organizations to bring together our membership and partners and build capacity amongst water and conservation groups across the Columbia Basin. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge some of the organizations who have made this webinar series possible. And their uh, logos are presented here, as well as the Columbia Basin Trust for their continued um, sponsorship support and for both the KCP and um, the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. There are several other webinars that are going to be available in this series. Um, we have them outlined here. So again, our second webinar is in December on the 11th. And Steve will be joining us from the Nature Conservancy, looking at investing in climate resilient landscapes, building confidence that your conservation planning will build off in the long term. And that webinar will be hosted by the Kootenai Conservation Program, as well as there are three other webinars that are going to be taking part in the series um, in the new year, starting in 2015. So if you're interested in more information, um, go to either of the Kootenai Conservation or the Columbia Basin Watershed Network websites and uh, register. Before we begin, there's a few housekeeping things that I just need to uh, touch base on. I will be administering the webinar. If you have any technical questions or issues, please send me a message and I'll do my best to address them. Also, if you lose your connection or are removed for the, from the webinar for any reason, please click on the link that was provided to you when you registered and it should plug you back into the session. We would like to thank you in advance for your patience. I know we have people um, joining us from remote communities across the basin and so hopefully we have a good connection throughout this session. You will notice that the participants have been placed on a blanket mute, and this has been done to avoid background noise and feedback throughout this session. We've received over 60 registrants for, for this um, particular presentation, so there's going to be lots of folks on the line. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the chat box. Will is going to enlighten us for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions at the end. So you're welcome to post your questions throughout the presentation, but we're going to wait and address them during the question session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Will Warnock, who's an aquatic biologist with the Canadian Columbia Intertribal Fisheries Commission. He describes himself as a young scientist that works for the Tanaha and Shaquetmik First Nations through the Canadian Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission. He provides expertise in aquatic resource management and delivers fisheries research programs to evaluate and minimize impacts of hydroelectric facilities on aquatic ecosystems and restore ocean-going fish to the Canadian Columbia River Basin. He holds a PhD in biosystems and biodiversities from the University of Lethbridge and he resides in, in Kimberley, British Columbia. So welcome Will and I am going to now um, give him the controls for the presentation so that he can deliver his talk. <laughs> 
Hi, thanks very much, Katie. Um, so I'm going to, uh, first of all, thank the KCP and CBWN for hosting this series. Very pleased to be the first in the, the speaker, uh, speaker series that's lined up. It sounds like uh, you've got some really good speakers lined up. Um, just uh, like to start by uh, saying who I work for. Canadian Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission is an organization that provides scientific and technical support to the Tinaha and Shaquamek First Nations in the Columbia Basin. So I'm going to walk you through kind of what I'm going to go through in my presentation. Um, first I'm going to cover the history of anadromous fish in the basin. What species did we have? Where did they end up? Uh, the importance of salmon to the ecosystem how they were lost, the development that's happened since salmon were lost because they've been gone for 75 years now, and environmental changes that have resulted as, um, as the, uh, the way that development has occurred. And then talk about what's happening now and into the future and challenges for restoring salmon and anadry other anadromous fish to the basin. So I'll just start by going a little bit over a biology backgrounder of the life cycle of an anadromous uh, salmonid fish. So anadromous means that the fish complete their life cycle in freshwater, they spawn in freshwater, uh, but live as adults primarily in salt water. So I'll begin with, um, begin with this area. When adults enter freshwater, they begin their migration upstream, up rivers. Salmon then find their natal stream in which they spawn. So they, they do need flowing water to spawn in. So uh, with, uh, with most species, they need to home back to their natal river where they were born. And they spawn in that area, and they die after they spawn. The only exception to this is steelhead, uh, which is not technically a salmon, uh, but is an anadromous rainbow trout. After spawning, um, their eggs are deposited in gravel when they spawn, and they develop in that gravel. And in terms of interior streams, uh, like we'd have in the interior Columbia Basin, they would have to overwinter in the gravel. Uh, eggs would hatch in the spring uh, and develop into these little alvins, uh, and these fish are closely associated with the gravel and feed off of a yolk sac before emerging from the gravel. And then they rear in freshwater depending on species. Um, to, from months to several years, and then th uh, this is when they undergo that critical imprinting phase um, to find out where to go back to to spawn. Uh, they undergo a series of physiological changes after that called smoltification, which allows them to exist in salt water, and this is accompanied by their migration downstream to the ocean. And then, depending on species, they typically spend about two to four years in the high seas feeding as adults uh, before they complete their life cycle and return to their natal river to spawn. So I'll just go through the baseline of uh, what species were where in the Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin. Uh, so the area that was accessible to anadromous fish in the Canadian Columbia Basin, I've highlighted the watershed area here. So the Columbia River starts at Columbia Lake and it's about a 2,000 kilometer journey down to the ocean at Astoria here. So salmon would have historically been able to access the entire part of the watershed, except for the Kootenai uh, portion of the watershed. They could only get a short way up Kootenai River to a place called Bonington Falls, a historic picture of Bonington Falls here. And salmon were restricted from moving upstream through the Kootenai system. So Kootenai Lake never had anadromous salmon, uh, but the main stem of the Columbia River was accessible to salmon. Just go through the distribution of each species, um, starting with Chinook salmon. Chinook were our largest species, uh, very large, 25 kilos or about 55 pounds was the maximum size, and the ones migrating to the headwaters would have all been uh, average, uh, 35 pounds or larger. Um, so in conjunction with their historical abundance and their very large size, this means that they probably were the highest biomass of any salmon migrating into the Canadian portion of the Columbia River. 
Uh, so very abundant, very big fish, obviously very key driver in the ecosystem. And now these fish have very high fat content and because of their large size, these are adaptations that allow them to make very long migrations upstream. So they're the only ones that made it right to the headwaters at Columbia Lake. And that is 2,000 kilometers um, from the ocean for the very upper stock that would have used the area. Now there are two different forms of Chinook salmon. Um, and this is, it is very important to recognize the stream type Chinook salmon um, is a race of salmon uh, Chinook that would have started their spawning migration in the spring. And they're the ones that made it all the way through the Columbia Basin right to the headwaters. There's another type of Chinook called the ocean type Chinook and these are later run. Um, they run in the summer and fall. And these uh, never historically made it to the headwaters, so they would have been restricted lower down in the basin. This is still a long migration. It's about 1,200 kilometers to this area, uh, but they, they aren't the long-distance athletes that the stream type are. Just go through a little bit more of an explanation of these two different races of Chinook because it's, uh, it's very interesting and it has repercussions on, uh, on what we lost and uh, diversity that we've lost of salmon. Uh, there is a very deep evolutionary split between these two types of Chinook. Their common ancestor goes back about 100,000 years or longer. So Pre-glacial times is when these two different uh, types of races of Chinook diverge from one another. So it's kind of like the relationship that humans would have had to Neanderthals in terms of ev evolutionary ancestry. Uh, we know this because if we look at Chinook salmon across their range in the Pacific Rim, North American coast of the Pacific Rim, uh, and we look at the relationship of interior Columbia stream type versus interior Columbia ocean type. Uh, and this is a plot of the relationships between all stocks in the Pacific Rim of North America. It's a very, very deep evolutionary split between the two. Interior Columbia stream type are actually more closely related to all Chinook in Alaska Yukon, North BC coast, interior Fraser, and down the Oregon coast than they are to the ocean type Chinook that spawn alongside them. So very, very two different species, uh, different evolutionary legacy, and uh, functionally we can think of them as two different species. Because they do two, uh, they have two very separate ecological niches and uh, do separate things. Adults of the stream type variety migrate very far up the continental shelf when they're in the open ocean. Uh, when they return to freshwater, they begin their migration very early in the spring. And then a uh, key difference is that after they hatch the following spring after their parents have spawned, they spend a full another year in freshwater before migrating out. Uh, also, they ascend tributaries more readily, so they would have been extensively distributed throughout watersheds, but typically have individual populations or stock sizes that are smaller. And because, uh, because they, uh, especially this adaptation for spawning and um, uh, spending a full year in freshwater, that's an adaptation that allows them to make very, very long distance migrations. Because the juveniles, when they hatch, they get to rear a full year, they're much larger, and they're able to make that long distance migration downstream to the ocean. Uh, so this, this is a type of salmon you'd find, for instance, in the Yukon, where Shinook can make migrations of over 3,000 kilometers. Uh, ocean type, uh, different adaptations. Uh, out on the coast, uh, out in the ocean, they're typically found along the continental shelf. They migrate later in the year. and uh, after they spawn, after they hatch, uh, the juveniles begin their migration downstream to the ocean very soon after ha hatching. They're also typically well adapted to spawning in the main stems of large rivers, and typically stock sizes are very abundant, but they can't make those long distance migrations far inland. Uh, sockeye salmon were also in the Canadian Columbia Basin, also a very important species to the area. Now, all Columbia Basin sockeye are lacustrine, meaning that they require lakes as to fulfill their life history. This is because the juveniles feed on zooplankton, which you find in lake systems. Uh, much smaller than Chinook, 
two to five kilos is still sizable fish, but not as large as Chinook. So probably, you know, they might have outnumbered Chinook, uh, but because they weren't individually as large, probably not as much biomass that they returned to the system as Chinook. Uh, these fish use the Arrow Lakes complex primarily, um, but were also distributed into Slocan and Washington Lakes. Now, the Columbia Basin doesn't isn't the producer of sockeye that Fraser is, or that Bristol Bay is, but uh, all this sockeye that would have come through the Columbia historically would have been much more abundant, and really the primary drivers of that are lakes in Canada. The system in the U.S. for lake systems, they didn't have a ton of accessible large lake habitat available to them, so the vast majority of sockeye habitat was in Canada. So uh, the Okanagan Basin is part of the Canadian Columbia Basin and historically was all accessible to sockeye salmon. Right now, sockeye can still make it back to Soyuz Lake. Uh, there's recently been a reintroduction of sockeye into Skaha Lake. And to give you an idea of the abundance, uh, there was a run of 600,000 sockeye this year into the Columbia. Uh, 600 plus thousand, and about 85% of those fish would have been destined for a Soyuz lake. You can see the tiny size of Soyuz relative to all these different lakes that would have been accessible for sockeye. So it gives you an idea of the potential abundance of sockeye that would have been here historically. Kokanee, of course, are still distributed in the uh, Canadian Columbia Basin. Uh, they are landlocked sockeye, so they are the same species. Uh, and they were native historically to Kootenai Lake, but they've been stocked extensively elsewhere. They're about a tenth the size of ocean-going sockeye. Steelhead were another species of, species of anadromous fish that we had. Uh, this is simply a form of rainbow trout that goes out to the open ocean and back. Historically at about the same distribution as ocean pipe chinook and were locally abundant in that area. And throughout the Columbia Basin, we still have bull trout, white sturgeon, and resident rainbow trout, but connectivity is an issue for them now. Um, historically, they would have had the full run of this river. Uh, bull trout and rainbow trout are distributed throughout the river. Um, white sturgeon are now extirpated upstream from Revelstoke Dam, so this whole area is now extirpated of white sturgeon. Pacific lamprey are another species that are anadromous. Of course, not at all closely related to salmon. Uh, we don't know historically if they ever reached the Columbia ba Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin. Um, they certainly could have, and if they did reach the Canadian portion, uh, we don't know how abundant they were. So it's a big question mark. We know about where these fish were distributed and the abundance of them, partially from memories of elders, memories of basin residents that were uh, were in the area at the time that salmon were here, and from archaeological evidence. So here's some uh, a diagram of some areas where there's some major First Nation fishing locations of salmon in the basin. So where does salmon get now? Well, they were originally extirpated by Grand Coulee Dam. This is about 200 kilometers, 210 kilometers downstream from the U.S.-Canada border. That was originally what did them in. Now they're restricted to Chief Joseph Dam. Uh, it's uh, nearly 100 kilometers downstream of that location. Uh, so this is the area that salmon can get to now. All these little ticks along here are major dams that are built along the Columbia River. But this area that's shaded in green are areas where it's still accessible to salmon because these dams have fish passage. So for example, here's a picture of Bonneville Dam, the lowest dam on the Columbia Basin, um, on the Columbia River, and uh, here's the fish ladder that salmon can ascend to get above this dam. So I mentioned that fish were anadromous fish were extirpated in 19 um, by Grand Coulee Dam. This was in the early 1940s, so about 75 years ago. Uh, the Canadian federal government was notified that the U.S. wanted to build this dam. The U.S. did consult with Canada at the time, uh, 
And uh, this letter here is a response from the then Undersecretary of uh, State for External Affairs, so you know, the, the department that would be equivalent to DFAD-D now, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. But basically what they said is, we don't have a commercial fishery for salmon on our portion of the Columbia River, so therefore um, it's okay if you build this dam, essentially. So they, they were probably more concerned at the time of their relationship with the U.S. than um, than of uh, you know run a salmon that went to an area that was very sparsely populated. Now the loss of salmon is really a devastating loss to the people who lived in the basin, particularly most felt by First Nations and tribes. Uh, from the time that uh, that these First Nations and tribes occupied the area, salmon were really a central species in the subsistence, economic, cultural, and spiritual well-being of these people. So the loss was devastating for them. But, you know, the loss of salmon is devastating for everyone. Um, a huge part of the cultural identity of British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest is attached to salmon. They're a very iconic people for us. Um, and they're a nexus point for all our common interests to come together. There's a, there's a reason why salmon are frequently on the front, front page of newspapers across the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia. It's because they're a big deal. People really like salmon. And it's important to recognize that salmon provide economic benefits to us. It, the loss of salmon is not only a, lot, a cultural loss, it's also an economic loss. And it, you know some of those losses can be hard to put a dollar value on because uh, some of them are direct, they're easy to put a dollar value on, but some are indirect and, uh, and you know, including ecosystem services. And I think uh, that's something that we don't have a good concept of how to, how to value. So what was the importance of salmon to the ecosystem in the Columbia Basin? Well, they must have been a keystone species because they were so abundant. Uh, we're talking about those numbers, um, we're talking about thousands to tens of thousands of metric tons of biomass. Uh, so what ecologists call this is a nutrient subsidy. And what that is is a fertilization of the ecosystem, a massive transfer. You can think of it as a massive wealth transfer from one area of abundance uh, to an area that's relatively poor in abundance. Uh, so what essentially salmon do is they fertilize freshwater ecosystems. And this isn't only in the form of, you know, provision of phosphorus and nitrogen and these chemicals that fertilize um, the bottom of the food web, but also there's a direct food source of carcasses, eggs, fry, and smolts um, in great abundance to species um, that were historically relied on them, like sturgeon, uh, piscivorous fish like bull trout and rainbow trout, um, birds and mammals that would have depended on them as well. And uh, finally, bioturbation. Um, kind of sounds like a dirty word, but uh, essentially what that refers to is the disturbance that salmon create in the stream bed, uh, especially when you talk about big salmon in smaller streams, uh, they actually have a very large effect on the morphology of the stream bed, um, which has uh, a sort of, uh, effects on the aquatic ecosystem around it. Uh, so increasingly recognized as a major um, process in aquatic ecosystems, that's something that we've lost as well because of uh, the lack of these big fish coming in and, uh, and churning up gravel to spawn. Now what happened after Grand Coulee Dam was built? Well, the Canadian Columbia River has a huge amount of hydropower development, and that hydropower development progressed with the historic uh, presence and distribution of salmon completely forgotten. In 1944, Brilliant Dam goes in in the Kootenai, 51 Watchin. 1954 uh, goes Juanita Dam into the Pend Oreille River. Hugh Keenly side is our first Columbia River Treaty Dam in 1968, followed closely by the very large Mica Dam in 1973, 79 Seven Mile Dam, another dam on the Pend Oreille, and 83 Revelstoke. These are all major dams on what was historically areas that were accessible to salmon. None of these dams provide passage facilities. Uh, so there's still lots of fish in the basin, and if the fish pass over those dams, they're not getting back up. 
And especially from the building of MICA and Keatley side dams, the Columbia River Treaty dams, there's been a very, very large alteration of the actual environment of the river. So pardon the pun here, but uh, these cause some big dam environmental changes. Um, you know, the first of which, uh, obviously connectivity, so fish passage, uh, essentially providing breakpoints that fish can't get above dams and at some points below because there's high mortality when fish uh, go below, especially some of these dams. Uh, I referred to um, to the alteration of flows by, uh, by the Columbia River Treaty dams, particularly Keenly Side and Micah, and also some upstream dams on the Kootenai, Duncan, and Libby. Uh, what essentially these uh, dams do is their storage facilities um, so that the Columbia River can be run as an industrial river. Uh, this graph to the right here is showing what the flow is like in the Columbia River just upstream from the U.S. Canada border. And this darker line is what the flow would have been like through the year before those Columbia River Treaty Dams were put out, uh, were put in. So what happens is during this period from May to August, all the water that falls into uh, the Rockies and the Purcells is melting. Um, all the snow is, is melting in this period and it causes a big flood pulse. Essentially what we've done is we've created these very large reservoirs upstream to capture that pulse. Uh, this has dual benefits of providing, um, first of all, flood control. So far downstream areas like Portland don't get flooded on a very regular basis, but also so you can maximize power generation in the winter. So essentially, you take out this big flow, uh, flow pulse of the snow melt, and then you release it now through the winter period when you can sell power for a lot more because there's a lot more demand for power. Uh, so, so flow is obviously a large um, driver of the way natural ecosystems uh, function. Now, temperature has also been altered as a result of these changes, um, particularly mica and revelstoke dams are very tall dams, and they have their uh, BC Hydro hates spilling water over the top of those dams. They prefer to run uh, as much water as possible through the turbines, and the turbines are located uh, quite a ways down on the dam face, so they draw cold water out, um, cause the river below them to be much colder than would have been historically. Uh, but some areas upstream, so upstream from these, uh, particularly Mica Dam, much warmer now because large standing water, body water and warmer below Keeneland Side Dam. Also because of the way these systems operate, they trap a lot of sediment um, and alter sediment transport regimes, uh, partially through taking out this big pulse of, uh, of flood flows that used to occur. And then, of course, not, last but not least, creating reservoirs changes the system from a river to a lake. Uh, what this does is inundates many historic spawning locations, rearing locations, and traditional fishing locations. But, you know, not just hydropower has happened since, uh, since that era. There's been a lot more development of the basin, more urbanization, linear development, so referring to roads and infrastructure like transmission lines, and watershed development are two big industries being mining and forestry. All of this has an effect on water and habitat quality and quantity. And climate change is often talked about as, a, as you know, an unknown about how uh, how, what the future holds for salmon habitat that historically would have been in the basin. I, I think this is um, a hopeful story here because the Canadian Columbia Basin, if we look at projected climate change impacts, is still, still remains thermally suitable and less impacted due to climate change projections. Uh, so we see in the Canadian Columbia Basin that we still have a snow-driven, um, snow-dominant hydrograph um, in the future, even projecting to the end of the century, and still have very cool temperatures in the area. So, so this is not a dire situation in terms of the Canadian Columbia Basin. We're much less affected by uh, potential negative impacts of climate change, at least with respect to how they affect salmon habitat, than you would find in the U.S. part of the range. 
Now, as a result of, uh, of some of those abiotic changes, uh, changes to the physical environment, there's also been ecosystem changes, very major ecosystem changes as a result of that. Uh, we get an increased productivity of some resident fisheries as a result of these reservoirs being constructed. Kokanee have absolutely exploded in the Canadian Columbia Basin. Um, you know, to the point where I think sockeye are actually more abundant in numbers um, than they ever historically would have been, uh, but in the form of a landlocked uh, form of that, uh, which is kokanee. Uh, so we do have millions of kokanee in the basin now, but those don't replace the ecosystem component that sockeye would have provided because they're not providing that nutrient, marine-derived nutrient subsidy. Um, but as a result of kokanee exploding, some of those areas you find uh, fish that feed off them profiting as well. So in some areas, bull trout and rainbow trout have profited from kokanee being available as a food source. Uh, in other areas, because of these dams, you get decreased productivity of some fisheries. White sturgeon undoubtedly hit very hard by hydroelectric development. And some areas, particularly lower down in the basin, um, like the lower Columbia River, where we hardly ever find bull trout anymore, and uh, some areas where rainbow trout have been negatively affected, like between Rowell Stoke and uh, Micah Dam. Nutrient loss and impoundment is a huge problem that we, um, we annually try and tackle in the basin here. In addition to the loss of marine-derived nutrients from salmon being gone, uh, we now have these large reservoirs, and essentially what they do is they trap the nutrients that flow in off the watershed, and that, those nutrients are recycled in the standing water body because they're taken up by phytoplankton, phytoplankton are eaten by zooplankton, kokanee eat the zooplankton. So essentially nutrients now, um, we've altered the nutrient transport regime of nutrients flowing downstream and uh, the province does spend hundreds of thousands of dollars annually to fertilize lakes in the area um, to compensate for this. Uh, and it, uh, the inundation obviously created um, inundation of huge amounts of floodplain um, wetland and riparian areas, and uh, the wild card I've got there, species introductions and invasions, um, not only fish but also invertebrates like mice's relicta, and uh, we all know about uh, the impending mussel invasion. That uh, could be a very large game changer here. Um, this is just a uh, list of non-native fish that you'd find on Ponderé River. Uh, if you were at the U.S.-Canada border, all of these fish can move downstream, make it into the Columbia River. In fact, most have, and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it's unknown about uh, the ecosystem level effects that some of these fish could have, but uh, they could could cause large damage in some situations. So I've just painted a pretty dire picture. Um, so that begs the question, if salmon return here, will they even have a home? Is habitat su still suitable? Well, first of all, we do need a fish pa passage strategy at these dams because fish can't get above these dams if salmon were to return. Uh, but, you know, we have tons of resident salmonids that are doing very well in the basin. Uh, resident salmonids, like particularly rainbow trout, have very similar habitat requirements to Pacific salmon, in fact, identical requirements to steelhead, and they're largely abundant throughout the basin. Uh, so we still have large quantities of habitat that must still be appropriate for salmon. Uh, the operation of our dams, we, we can operate the dams smarter so that we can actually improve habitat, and we have done this in areas such as uh, the Columbia River below Keenly Side Dam, where now we can essentially tweak flows to make spawning habitat much better for rainbow trout. And uh, that area has one of the best rainbow trout fisheries in the world. And, you know, I, I said that climate change wasn't necessarily a di dire picture in the Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin. It is in the U.S. portion of the Columbia Basin. So our area is a thermal refuge for salmon. Uh, so it's really justified in getting salmon back to the Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin as a climate change adaptation strategy. So if salmon were to get back, or we were to bring them back, how would we go about it? Well, I'll just go a little bit about fish passage, uh, go into fish passage a little bit here. Uh, but we're very, very good at getting fish past dams now. And the technology and the scientific understanding 
of this has really developed rapidly over the last couple decades, and that's largely been fueled by a lot of U.S. environmental legislation like the Endangered Species Act and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, which has required a lot more improvements to fish passage at Columbia Basin dams. Uh, so the traditional way of getting adults up and above the dam, uh, obviously with fish ladder, uh, at high head dams you can use a trap and haul strategy where you uh, you allow fish to migrate into an area that you can then trap them and then manually haul them up and above a dam. Uh, we also have upcoming technologies. Um, you might have seen uh, delightfully absurd but uh, potentially promising technology of the salmon cannon, uh, which you can actually uh, potentially shoot fish up above dams, which is currently being tested in areas in the U.S. portion of the basin. Uh, you know, getting adults up is half the battle. You have to get juveniles safely downstream. Juveniles can migrate through um, a couple of routes of any dam. This is over the spillway if the dam is spilling water, which typically has generally high survival rates if the dam isn't very high, uh, or through the turbines. And uh, there's been a lot of advancements lately in developing more fish-friendly turbines, so you get much lower mortality if fish happen to go that route. Uh, we also have ways to manually uh, trap fish in the four bays of dams, collect juveniles, and either manually truck them around or pipe them safely around the dam. And we've had a lot of success stories in the Columbia Basin lately for fish passage and restoration of salmon. In the Okanagan Basin, sockeye have recovered a hundredfold over the last um, decade and a half. And that's largely been aided by reintroduction efforts, um, habitat restoration and fish passage improvements at Columbia dams. A lot of this has been spearheaded by the Okanagan Nation Alliance. And it's resulted uh, lately in a commercial and recreational fishery actually being open for sockeye. And th this is a rebound from a population that was down to a few thousand individuals, now numbering in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, in the Deschutes River, um, there's been a reintroduction strategy lately with some cutting edge technology to get fish up and over and safely above and then below these high head dams. Uh, so definitely advancements in technology we can look to uh, and recent success stories. Now, if salmon were to be restored above Grand Coulee Dam, they do have an area of free-flowing river that we call the Transboundary Reach here. Um, that certainly would still be suitable for Chinook salmon. Uh, but to get to a lot more habitat, uh, there needs to be passage provided at three key dams. So Hugh Keenly Side, Brilliant, and Juanita. The good news is that passage at these dams opens up a ton of habitat. And these aren't necessarily difficult to um, difficult dams to provide passage on, and furthermore, existing environmental assessment uh, certificate commitments require the operators of the company that put recent expansions on those dams um, to consider fish passage if the U.S. does restore salmon um, above Grand Coulee Dam and into Canadian waters. So I'll just elaborate on each one of those, those dams now. So Juanita is definitely the not the lowest hanging fruit of the of those three dams. What you get above Juanita Dam, Juanita's on the Pond Array, it's not on the Columbia, but it's a very, very short run up the Columbia. You essentially pass the US Canada border, go a few hundred meters, and then if you were to take a hard right, you go into this major river of the, the Pond Array, and it's only about five hundred meters from the confluence of the Columbia to the dam, Juanita Dam there. Um, this, uh, this rise over run um, for a dam nearly 80 meters high makes, uh, makes a fish ladder mathematically impossible. You can't put a fish ladder on this dam. What you could do is put a trap and haul facility, but even if you got them above that dam, it would be 10K before you hit Seven Mile Dam, another dam that went in subsequently. Uh, so you'd need some kind of coordinated passage strategy in trying to bypass um, this stretch, essentially, if you wanted to provide a passage here. Uh, but what you'd get is, uh, is quite a bit of habitat in the Salmo River, which historically did have salmon. 
Brilliant Dam is perhaps the lowest hanging fruit of the bunch in terms of how easy it is to provide passage. And uh, the key habitat you get here is in Slocan Lake, um, which would be suitable for sockeye, and the Slocan River, which would be suitable for steelhead and chinook. Uh, it's low hanging fruit because the dam isn't particularly high. It'd be uh, an engineering cinch to put a, a fish ladder on this structure. And uh, furthermore, this is word for word the environmental assessment certificate commitment. Um, I don't know what BEPC is a is an acronym acronym for in expansion something committee maybe. Uh, we'll install fish passage facilities at Brilliant if in the future salmon runs are reestablished into the Canadian portion of the Bear River and if fish agencies permit the installation. It's a pretty strong commitment there. Hugh Keenly side dam and Arrow Lakes generating station um, is another pretty low hanging fruit, but either, upstream of this dam there's a huge amount of habitat potential for sockeye and chinook. And passage isn't necessarily very difficult. It's a very broad valley in here, very broad dam, not particularly high. Uh, you could put a fish ladder in it for adults. Uh, the, the key technical challenge there is, um, is that the reservoir behind it fluctuates in water level. So we need some some innovative engineering solutions, but we certainly could work around it. Essentially what this EAC certificate um, commitment says is that Columbia Power uh, is committed to install fish passage facilities if, um, if BC Hydro agrees to it at their portion of what they own for Keenly Side Dam. Um, if salmon make it back into the Canadian Columbia River um, and uh, these different agencies agree to it. Now once you get very high up in the drainage, um, you encounter the very large obstacles. Revelstoke and mica dams are, are huge. They're, uh, they're juggernaut dams. Uh, Revelstoke's 175 meters high. Mica is 240 meters high, which makes it the tallest dam between US or Canada. And you, uh, you simply can't put a fish ladder on a dam this high. Um, it's very difficult, so you'd need some kind of trap and haul strategy um, or some other upcoming type of uh, fish passage device. Uh, but the good news is that these are the last obstacles in the drainage. We would look at restoring salmon downstream first before we, uh, we try to tackle these areas. And then uh, when we do get to these areas, um, you know, there might be new technology available to pass fish safely. Uh, but you do have a very large amount of pristine habitat in the very upper portion of the Columbia River um, for that would have been historic habitat for spring Chinook salmon. And uh, also you could uh, theoretically pass white sturgeon and get them reestablished in this area as well. So just sort of shift gears and talk a little bit more about what's hap been happening lately on the scene for salmon restoration. Um, recently, there's a very unprecedented collaboration between 15 tribes in the U.S. and three First Nations in Canada, and uh, a key kind of culmination of that um, collaboration is this uh, joint fish passage paper. And I, I can circulate this to people. My email address will be at the end of uh, the presentation, still in a, a, a very soon-to-be-released uh, draft form. But uh, essentially what this does is it outlines the background justification and high-level conceptual strategy for the plan of fish passage restoration. And a big part of that is, um, is outlining this phased incremental approach to scientifically investigating the key uncertainties that we need to know, um, overcome for, um, for how we'd actually go about this. So what that scientific investigation program is, um, is four phases. The first two phases are essentially uh, desktop studies, research, and experimental reintroductions that reduce some of the key technical uncertainties we have about how to best reintroduce salmon and uh, provide fish passage. Uh, phase three um, goes on what we've learned from those previous two phases in um, a transition into a permanent program of passage. And then phase four is course, from what we've learned from the previous three phases, monitoring and adaptive management. Uh, certainly key that investigation should occur collaboratively between the U.S. and Canada, should involve all, um, all key agencies, and 
you know, to be most efficient, guided by some sort of an international technical working group. So what are some of those key scientific uncertainties? Uh, well, here's four um, that are very, the, the, there's many, but these are kind of the four that stand out in my mind. Uh, first of all, what donor stocks do you use? We've, we've lost the original stocks that would have, been used the, would have used the area, uh, but if you wanted to reintroduce salmon to the area, the environment's changed. What stock out there exists now that would have the greatest chance of making a go for it in the habitat we have available now? And currently, my organization is running on a scientific evaluation of that. Uh, perhaps the biggest uncertainty in my mind is uh, now we have this area that's a very large lake above Grand Coulee Dam. So this Grand Coulee Dam, the location of it's about 210 kilometers downstream from the U.S.-Canada border and almost all the way up to the U.S.-Canada border the river has been transformed into a lake. Now this lake is uh, is obviously not generating um, downstream currents that salmon would have historically used, particularly uh, juvenile salmon would have relied upon to help carry them down to the ocean. Uh, so now because you've transformed that, uh, that area fundamentally from a river to a lake, uh, can salmon make it back down and then reach the ocean in a timely manner? It's key uncertainty. Um, Habitat suitability uh, within different parts of the Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin. We know certain habitats are going to be suitable, but exactly how suitable are they? And how can we improve them, maybe with, uh, with dam operations or with in-stream physical works? And then finally, how we actually go about passing fish around these dams. Um, not only for salmon, but you know, make it a, a multi-species um, strategy. We'll pass lamprey and resident fish as well. Now, all these investigations must also come with a socioeconomic impact analysis and then consider ecosystem risk. There's a chance that if we don't do this properly, we actually make things worse. Uh, you know, potentially, we, we know that sockeye certainly can residualize and form kokanee, but Chinook can do this too. So let's say we introduced Chinook, they got into Arrow Lakes, and they didn't go to the ocean, they just remained in Arrow Lakes. Uh, essentially, they'd be competing with fish that we already have in that, native fish we already have in that system, bull trout and rainbow trout. Um, so, so this is not a desired outcome. Uh, can we actually, what are the risks of this happening? And, and all the, I have a list of some other types of risks we might have. And then, of course, costs and benefits of passage and operational modifications that we might make. So what are some key um, you know, future developments happening now um, or in the uh, future to, uh, to watch out for and some key challenges? Well, some upcoming advancements. Uh, the U.S. entity for, um, for review of the Columbia River Treaty is recommending that uh, to the U.S. State Department that salmon be an agenda item on a modernized Columbia River Treaty post-2024. That's, that's you know, a pretty major, um, major piece of this. Tribes and First Nations um, obviously have put a lot of background work into this and they're now kind of moving beyond political advocacy and public education and outreach and consultation and actually starting research programs on this. Um, and there, there's some new funding sources on the horizon, particularly the Northwest Power and Conservation Council, which is a very large body in the U.S. Uh, that essentially directs plans for mitigation and compensation works deriving from hydropower um, uh, that uh, that this is actually in their upcoming plan, their 2014 plan, uh, to actually investigate fish passage at Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph Dams. And then, of course, there's a lot more local support for uh, salmon restoration and awareness. Now, challenges that we, uh, these are very major challenges. Um, so it's not actively supported by either the Canadian or U.S. federal governments at this time. What I mean by actively supported is that neither, um, no federal departments in either of those uh, those countries actively provide, um, actively come out and say that we're we have a strategy to try and make this um, make this a reality. The province of British Columbia continues to defer um, these issues to the federal government, and you know unlike 
the U.S. entity, British Columbia, is unsupportive of salmon being part of a modernized Columbia River Treaty. And you know, finally, uh, you know, it's an it's an issue of power power and politics in the province. Uh, would this have ever happened on the Fraser River? There's a reason why the Fraser River never even had a large dam built on it, or the main stem of the the Fraser River doesn't even have a dam is because people wouldn't stand for it. There's too much of too many people, too much of the voter base that lives downstream from those areas that would be affected by them. Um, you know, comparatively, the Columbia Basin has a very small population compared to the rest of the province, and uh, and less of a less power to influence the politics of this province. And power politics are huge in British Columbia. You know, that's because nearly half the electricity generated in this province comes from dams in the Columbia Basin. You know, and that means that these dams provide a massive economic benefit to the, Briti to the province of British Columbia. It's part of the reason why our power rates here are very low. Um, you know, and uh, this, is a, this is a key political issue for, for British Columbia and has been for a very large, long time. You know, none of these dams that, that generate this power for the province have passage facilities either for our resident freshwater fish or salmon when they return. And none of the income generated from the sale of the electricity of those dams is invested back into fish passage or salmon restoration research and development. So just to summarize kind of my key points of the presentation, salmon were a key historic component of this ecosystem. Their loss continues to have an environmental and socioeconomic impact to especially the residents of the Columbia Basin in Canada. Salmon habitat has been altered, but certainly still exists. Restoration is timely and justified, especially in the context of climate change. And, you know, salmon restoration is going to have significant technical challenges, but there's not insurmountable. There's lots of success stories we can look to elsewhere that um, that make us confident that this is possible. Uh, but the key challenges really still are political and social um, to actually come out and uh, and make this a reality. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending this presentation. Uh, thanks to Columbia Basin Watershed Network and KCP for hosting this series. Uh, Columbia Basin Trust has been very supportive to my organization for salmon restoration efforts and uh, key key staff at Fisheries and Oceans Canada who have been you know willing to engage with us on these issues even if it's off the side of their desks so I'm um, really really appreciative to that department um, and then of course all the staff and uh, and First Nations and tribes who have been fighting for this for a very long time and uh, and laid a lot of the groundwork of the presentation that I've, uh, I've just gone through so thanks very much. Thank you, Will. That was excellent. A uh, few questions have been trickling in um, as the, the presentation has been, has, the session has been going. Um, one person provided an acronym for the BPC, and it's the Brilliant Expansion Power Corporation. So thanks, Teal, for that. Um, Graham asks, would Chinook and possibly Sockeye have historically gone up the lower Kettle River to Christina Lake, downstream of Cascade Falls? Hi, Graham. I, uh, I don't think that uh, salmon were actively into the Christina Lake system. Um, I, I do believe that Kokanee are native to Christina Lake, which implies that at one time Sockeye would have been able to um, to access Christina Lake uh, in the same way that uh, that Kootenai Lake has Kokanee. Um, so historically, you know, some salmon got over Bonington Falls, or Bonington Falls wasn't as much a barrier at some point. Uh, I think the story is the same in Christina Lake, where uh, where um, you know, historically there might have been a trickle of fish that came in and colonized that area, but wouldn't have had major runs to it. 
Okay. I would encourage anyone, if you have any additional questions, to please um, put them in the chat box. Um, a few people have asked if this webinar is going to be available, um, recorded after this session, and yes, for this um, session of the Winter Webinar Series, Will has agreed um, to this recording, so it will be posted on our website. Um, the next question, Sally asks, what's the connection between climate change and the suggestion that the Columbia Basin might be a thermal refuge for salmon. Um, and she's asked you to please expand upon this, Will. Okay, so if we look at, um, at our, even our longest projections of climate change, um, in the U.S. part of the Columbia Basin, there's very dire impacts to, uh, to the timing and uh, um, an amount of snowfall that's going to occur in the U.S. part of the range. Uh, so in mountainous regions in Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Montana, there is a lot less snow accumulation, a lot more rain. Um, this creates uh, a, an altered hydrograph that isn't necessarily friendly for salmon um, and other species of salmonids. We also get much, uh, we also get a projection of warming, uh, particularly air warming in the area those areas which cause into the lethal temperatures for, uh, for peak summer temperatures in a lot of those rivers in the U.S. part of the basin. basin. In the Canadian part, portion of the basin, those impacts are much more muted. Um, so there is still, there's actually projected increasing snowfall in very small areas of the basin, but not a major shift of, uh, of snow to rain dominated um, dominated precipitation regimes, so we don't have the same types of impacts uh, that you would have in the U.S. and the warming trends don't reach um, uh, tr levels that they would actually create a significant amount of warming in our rivers in the Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin that would actually be lethal for salmon. Um, so the area really can be seen as still um, with our best projections still suitable for salmon in the future and being, you know, this pocket or a refuge for salmon um, relative to the rest of the basin, which is primarily in the U.S. Hey, thanks, Will. I want to honor everyone's time um, and end this session at 11 Pacific time. So we'll just take one more question. And that being said, if you have additional pressing questions that you would like to ask Will, you're welcome to email, email him and follow up after the event. So we'll finish with, what is the risk of introducing invasive non-native fish species via fish ladders or fish transportation? And how can fish transportation facilities be selective to exclude these invasive? Uh, that is a... Uh... Great question. Um, the, there are certain ways you can build. Uh, so, so let's uh, let me take a step back. And uh, th there's two routes here: um, either upstream or downstream passage. Uh, upstream passage refers to um, you know fish ladders or other ways you might get fish up above the dam, adult fish up above the dam. You can build your fish ladders, so they're essentially um, directed towards a physiological requirements of salmon. Salmon are very strong swimmers relative to a lot of these non-native fish that we have. So you could build your fish ladder so that only salmon could essentially pass through it. Um, now let's say you took another approach and rather than using the fish ladder, you use something like a trap and haul strategy. Well, you're handling each individual fish in that situation. So you could you know, remove non-natives actually cull them if you wanted to, and then actually only transfer your salmon up above. When we talk about downstream passage, um, it's the same sort of idea. If you had some sort of passage facility that, uh, um, like a, a passive way of doing it where you attracted, a, created an attraction flow and then piped all fish around, you would uh, you'd be aiding the spread downstream of non-native fish. But um, if you did have a collection facility like we're seeing at a lot of these high head dams in other places throughout the, 
Columbia Basin in the U.S., you could manually sort out the non-native fish and then either call them or if you wanted to um, release them back upstream. Okay, thank you everyone. That concludes our first webinar of the series. I would encourage you all to, you know, take a look at the remaining webinars um, as part of this series and attend them as well. So thanks again, Will, and I hope everyone has a great day.